15 through 27. Then 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 27. And there we'll find these words written. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearers? If the whole were hearing, where were the smellers? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where was the body? But now are they many members yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these we bestow a more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Thus ends the reading of God's word. I want to encourage us all this morning from this subject, a balanced body. Talking about a balanced body. Thank you, ushers, for your service. We do appreciate you so much for what you do. The ministry of the church is only as strong and effective as the church itself. I don't mean the strength of the physical structure, no matter how large or how small it is or how elaborate or simple it is, for brick and mortar does not make a church. What matters is the spiritual makeup of the people who congregate in the building and the spiritual bond that exists between them. This is the key to vibrant and effective ministry how members relate to one another in the church, will show up in their ministry to others outside the church. That means that what happens on the outside must be reflected on the inside and vice versa. And I want to this time thank our men and our women and those who went over to Stew Pot this past week to serve those individuals over there. It was a wonderful ministry time. That's what we ought to be doing in ministering to others. Amen? I think I can say this on good authority because... Uh, there's a line that Jesus says in uh, the model of prayer when he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In giving us this model, Jesus uh, says that one of the first things you should consider when praying is that how things are done on earth should be reflective of how things are done in heaven. So uh, Bill just asked me this question, but Pastor, how are things done in heaven? Thank you for asking me that, Bill. John gives us the best, I would say, picture of this in his gospel uh, in three aspects. And these are not my points, but these are just going to help us understand the points. These are some indicators to help us understand. First, John says on that relationship between what's done in heaven, in heaven, things are done in an orderly fashion. Okay, John chapter 15, verse 26, that's John chapter 15, verse 26 says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Notice the order. The Holy Spirit comes from the Father by the request of the Son. Secondly, uh, in heaven, things are done by a unified front. Okay? John chapter 5, verse 19. That's John chapter 5 and verse 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Here, notice the father and the son are doing the same thing, and they're on one accord. And then thirdly, John shows his model in uh, heaven. 
uh, that is done as a, with an objective focus. That's objective focus in John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. That's John 17, 4 and 5. Jesus says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Notice the purpose in heaven is to glorify God. All right? So if heaven has an orderly, unified, objective focus in its operation, earth should also have the same order, unity, and objective focus the way we operate. There's an internal standard seen in God's operation which affects the external ministry. And if our feelings and concerns for others outside the church are not as equally shared for our uh, concerns for each other inside the church, then we're not balanced in our ministry and we're not going to be on the same level, pun in, no pun intended. Talking about being a balanced body. And so... With saying that, Bill asked me another question. He says, how then do we make sure that we are a balanced body? Bill, that's a very good question. How do we make sure we are a balanced body? Well, three quick ways, and I'm going to let you go watch the football games and get you some lunch. The text says here that we are one body. And the first thing we got to do, and here's my first point, we must recognize each other's roles. If we're going to be a balanced body, we got to recognize each other's role. The text says, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am, not of the, am I not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it not therefore the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members of each one of them in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, yet but one body. Every member of the church has a role. And we should never minimize those roles. Neither should a member feel that their role is not important or needed. Paul's analogy here of the physical body part shows us that everybody can't do the same job though, or something's going to go lacking. As a matter of fact, we were not made to do the same thing. A foot is not a hand, and it's not expected to do what hands do. But it's needed. Neither is an eye a ear. It is not expected, they're not expected to do what the other does, but they're needed. So each one must do what they were meant to do because they are needed. Now, God has created unity for us in the body. But watch this, watch this. Unity does not mean uniformity. There's diversity in who we are. We're different from each other. And we're not going to all think the same. We're not going to all look the same. We're not going to all want to uh, approach things the same way. But we still ought to be unified even when we're, because we're different. Why? Because we unify ourselves around the word of God. And if we are Christians, if we are children of God, if we are disciples of Christ, what God says, all of us ought to get on the same page and bandwagon. Don't matter how I personally feel about it. I mean, listen, I personally feel that Jackson State University has the best band in the world. Amen. Sister May Lambda would disagree with me. I still love her even though she's wrong. That's okay. But where we're going to be unified in is that Jackson State and Alcorn and even Valley is in the swag. And so when the swag stands together, we all together and win. Because there's something we will unify around, even in our diversity. Likewise, in the church, we must recognize what roles each member needs to play. And that should be based on the giftedness of the members. The text says, but God has set the members in the body as it has pleased him. In other words, God determines the roles that we play. Say it again. God determines the roles that we play. And the only way we know where we fit and what we are to do is by first understanding the nature and purpose of the church. And then by understanding the spiritual gift that God has given to us. See, one of the problems that we see in churches today is because people don't understand what the church purpose really is. But when we understand the nature and purpose of the church, then understand what God had intended for us to do and to be. 
and then understand what our gifts are, okay, then we can really be unified in doing what God called us to do. But if you don't know your spiritual gift, you will not be able to function properly in the body and you're going to hinder the church from being effective in ministry on the outside because you're out of place on the inside. Every Christian has a spiritual gift. If you say I'm a Christian, you have a spiritual gift. Now, you need to determine your spiritual giftedness and use your gift for the edifying of the body. Uh, see, we tend to think sometimes that just because pers- people have uh, some abilities, they can do just as much as the person who has specialized skills. Okay? You know, I can shoot basketball. Ain't no doubt. Y'all laugh. I can shoot. I mean, I still can shoot some ball now. But I don't have the specialized skill like Steph Curry to shoot a three-pointer. He may get five for five. I'm going to get four out of five. That's four out of five tries. I ain't said four out of five hits. So if you got me on a team with him and you're down two points and you need a three to win, you know who you're going to call. No, I will not be the one chosen to shoot. You're going to choose Curry, of course. Well, if the church needs someone to expound on the word to encourage the church, then you're going to look to utilize the member who has the gift of exhortation and not someone who just loves to talk. Oh, can make y'all laugh at a church picnic. Oh, can tell good jokes. Oh, know how to say stuff funny. Oh, who know how to just make everybody happy. No, that's not who you utilize. You use a person who has the spirit of exhortation if you're going to edify the body. That's the thing that many churches don't think about. See, we just think about becoming together, having fun, or enjoying ourselves, and we ought to do that as fellowship and singing the songs. But how are we edifying one another? And watch this. If you have a spiritual gift and you're not engaged in the church, using your spiritual gift, you're hindering the body. You're the cancer to the body of Christ. And so we are a, a balanced body when we understand and recognize each other's roles. But then secondly, to be a balanced body, we've got to respect each other's worth. I don't understand the role, but respect each other's worth. The text says, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Every member of the church is valuable. Everybody has worth. And we should never get the feeling that we can do without each other. My role may not be as big as yours, but what I do is as vital to the whole and the well-being of the body. And therefore, we should never make light of uh, the member who may not stand out like somebody else. Some people don't have the personalities to talk with. They just want to be quiet, but they're going to do what they do to edify the body. Paul's point here in the text is that we should respect the worth of all the members and make sure that no one feels like they are not needed. Here's the question, how, 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 how much do we put on our outward parts of the body? Like our face, our hands, our lips, our head, our feet. I mean, we put value on them by making sure they are well taken care of, don't we? Because people are going to see that stuff. So when we go out, you know, we're going to make sure that we get the lipstick on right. We're going to make sure the rouge ain't too heavy. We're going to make sure that the hair is right. We're going to press them curls down. We're going to make sure that the weave is in there good and ain't showing. Men, we're going to put that dye in there because I ain't that gray. I ain't, I ain't got a gray hand, man. You don't see no gray. Yeah, you don't use a whole bottle of that stuff. We take care of the outside. We want the outside to look good. But on the other hand, how much value do you put on your spleen? 
or your pancreas, your appendix, or your colon. Probably not much until something goes wrong with it. See, we're more concerned about how we will cover the outside of our body until we realize if the inside is not functioning properly, how we look on the outside really doesn't matter. Well, what does it matter if I have on a $500 suit to cover my chest if the lungs inside my chest ain't working? Well, what does it matter if I wear diamond rings and fancy jewelry on my fingers and around my neck if the arteries and the veins that pump blood through them are clogged and they not working like they ought to be? I'm saying we are a balanced body when we respect each other's worth. That means I've got to see beyond the facade. I've got to see beyond all the bling. I've got to see beyond all that and look at the heart of the individual who's my brother and my sister in Christ and realize that they are made in the Imagio Day, the image of God. And because of that, just like every part of the physical body has worth, every member in the body of Christ has worth. Now, because you have worth, that means your input is worth something. Uh, which leads me to my last point, which is if we're going to be a balanced body, we must respond to each other's world. We got to respond to each other's uh, world. Here's the reason why we've got to recognize each other's roles and, and respect each other's worth, because it's going to help us respond to the world that you're in. The text says that there should be no schism or no divisions in the body, uh, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. A schism is a split or division between strongly opposed sections of parties caused by a difference in opinion or belief. Okay? If I don't agree with, the, with you in policy and procedure, watch this it is highly likely that I will not care for you as a person. See, this, this seems to be the case in the, uh, the general society, particularly around political views that are different. Just because I may disagree with you and your brand of politics does not mean I have to dislike you. And that's one of the things that, that I hate about these times of years when we're looking at parties and candidates and politics and all that kind of stuff. You know, just because the person got a different viewpoint of yours does not mean that they're a bad person. All Republicans ain't bad. All Democrats ain't good. All Democrats ain't good. All Republicans ain't bad. All Republicans ain't good. All Democrats ain't bad. And however combination you want to fix it, you've got to get to know the person. And I get caught up in the politics. And, 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 and so, so unfortunately in the church, in the same manner, we tend to align ourselves up with people who think like us and see things the way we see things. And we'll go out of our way to help them when they need help or rejoice with them when something good is happening to them. If I agree with you and I like you, then I'm going to get with you no matter what's going on. I'm going to be a ride or die. But if you're not in my circle, hmm, I'm probably not going to be as willing to help you. Or if I do, I'm not going to go out of my way and inconvenience myself to do it. That's how many people think. That because we disagree in this, then I don't want to hang around you. No, 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 no. Maybe if, if they're wrong in what they're thinking or wrong in how they're living, then maybe because I am who I am in Christ, then maybe my being around them will help them to see the light of Christ. Or see things in a way that God would see things. But if I can't show compassion and concern for my brother in Christ, how can I really show compassion and concern for those who are outside the body? When Jesus came to fulfill his ministry, he wanted to make sure that those who uh, were to be his witnesses got the message first. And knew how to respond to each other before they could take the world the word of God. Listen, here's what he tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. That's Matthew 10, 4 and 5. He says this, 
These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And if you continue reading that passage, you'll see that he tells them not to take anything with them because he expects them to be taken care of by those who are of the same ethnicity and culture. In other words, he hopes that the Jews go respond to the Jews and take care of one another. In Romans chapter 10, Paul says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And so it's evident by the statement that Jesus makes and the statement that Paul makes that they are very concerned about the salvation of the Jews who were God's chosen people to be made no, make him known to the world. And when we show our concern, my brothers and sisters, for the things that are happening in the world of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and particularly those in the local church, we'll experience the type of balance that God wants us to have. In other words, when we are concerned about each other, when we're concerned about what's going on in your life within here in the body in here, then we'll have that balance that God wants us to have. See, how, how many of you remember playing the game, uh, uh, playing the thing, Seesaw? When you was a child, y'all remember playing Seesaw? They refer to them now, I think, as teeter-totters or something like that. You know, um, The object of the Seesaw is for each person to enjoy a ride by balancing the Seesaw, by shifting their weight up and down so that each one can enjoy the moment, right? And sometimes you're up, and sometimes you're down. But no matter which one you were, you continue to work together so each of you could experience a good time. It works because the board that you're riding on is balanced by a pivot in the center that we both can recognize. And watch this. For you to go up, I got to be willing to go down. And if you're willing to go down, you can lift me up. Ow! <laughs> I got half my cell phone now. I don't listen. Let, 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 listen. In church, sometimes you will suffer, and I need to be there to suffer with you. Sometimes you'll rejoice, and I need to be there to rejoice with you. But what we both have to realize is that we should be concerned with one another because of the common pivot that's between us, and that's the love of God. Jesus said, by this men will know that you're my disciples because you have love one for another. That There's a song that Hezekiah uh, walked walk and sang that said, uh, uh, I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's family, part of his body. That's what he says. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. Why? Because I need you to survive. And then he says, he said, I pray for you. You pray for me. I, I, I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. Why? I need you to survive. Now, y'all know Hezekiah Walker, right? I mean, you, you know of him, right? You heard of him. You don't know him personally. Some of y'all maybe heard of him. Who knows David Frazier? See, although Hezekiah Walker gets the credit and the shine for doing the song, David, Walker, David Frazier actually wrote the song. But who knows him? Not many people. But here's the thing. Although Hezekiah gets the credit, David Walker also gets a royalty check because he did the work. Let your light so shine before men. They may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Folks look at us and what we do as Christians, but we only do what we do because of what Christ has done over 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. They hung him high, and, and they stretched him wide, and he died for the sins of the world. They took him off that cross, and they put him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed there three days later, but all the Sunday morning, 
He had the grave of all power and authority in his hand. He said, go ye and make disciples in all the world, baptize them, teach them to deserve all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you, even to the end of the world. We ought to be a balanced body, which means that everybody that's in the body of Christ, particularly in the local church, who understands their spiritual gift, are doing everything they can to share that gift, to edify the body, to recognize that everybody has worth, recognize that everybody has a role, so that we can all be a part of each other's world and survive the way God wants us to survive. I need you. You need me. You ain't got to like everything I do, and, and maybe I do it wrong, but if you pray for me, and, and if you love me, and if, if you talk to me, and if you walk beside me and hold my hand, I might just do more better. A balanced body is what God is calling for. And sometimes the body ain't balanced because everybody trying to get on it one side. And got some folk don't want to get on this side because they got to sit by or stand by somebody on this side. But watch this, watch this. When a storm comes, when a storm comes, if the storm comes, begin to rock the boat. If we're there together holding on around the mast or around the pole that did it, and one person grabs a hold to it, another person grabs a hold of them and wraps them all around them, then there's more people holding on to something that's stable instead of us being separated and getting blown away by the wind on the boat. What I'm trying to say, if we all just embrace the word of God, and then you embrace the word of God. Come here, brother Buck. Come here, brother Buck. Come stand right here. Come here, brother John. I'm, I'm out. I'm finna get out. We finna go. We finna. Come here, brother D. Come here, brother Allison. Come here, come here. See, I, I got the word of God here. And I'm holding on this pass, okay? So the storm is coming. So Buck finna wrap his arm around me. Okay, John finna wrap his arm around me. All right, bro, Allison finna wrap his arm around me. All right, and I'm saying, come here, Jace. Come here, Jace. Come on, Jace. Come here, Mason. Come here, Mason. Come here, Braylon. Come on, man. Come on, man. Wrap your arm around. Come on, man. Just get around him. See, 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 see. See, we, we become more strong than that. Oh, We're man. getting stronger. Amen. And, 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 and now where I was shaking earlier, I can't shake anymore. Because these brothers got me. Amen. All right, y'all let me go for y'all. Poking me this now, y'all. They squares me real good there. <laughs> As a balanced body, let's show our compassion and concern for one another. Pray for one another. Love each other so that God will get the glory. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the fact that you died that we might live. And God, what you did for us in making the supreme sacrifice We'll do those same things by sacrificing one another. But I pray now there's someone in this place, in this house today, who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will touch them. Let them realize that to be a part of this body, they must accept what he did for us through his body by shedding his blood at Calvary, being buried and crucified and buried, God, and then rising from the dead on the third day with all power in his hand. God, do it as only you can do, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. A departure course, and we're ready to go. As you go, forgive somebody. Someone needs forgiveness now. As the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, share the love of Jesus Christ.